Good evening, this is NTV Weekend Edition and I'll get right into it with a look at the stories making headlines tonight. A member of parliament can work as a donor, a member of parliament can work as a life saver, a member of parliament can facilitate weddings, must attend weddings, must contribute. All that glitters is not gold. MPs justify their demand for a pay rise despite popular belief that they are well enumerated. Mitiana woman dumps newborn baby saying she didn't know the father. So the World Food Programme resorts to food airdrops. WFP is moving food by air. And WFP turns to airdropping food rations as part of South Sudan remains cut off due to flooding. I didn't know that it was a traffic officer, but I had to stop. Also tonight, innovation at its best. Traffic dummies to curb speeding along highways. You are watching NTV Weekend Edition. Good evening once again. Welcome to NTV Weekend Edition. I am Rukshan Namimba. In a top story tonight, the MP for Bufumbira East, Eddie Kwezira, says Ugandan legislators are constantly bombarded by financial demands by their constituents, which leaves them with very little money to spend. Kwezira says the situation justifies raising MP salaries. The lawmaker's revelation comes just a day after some MPs expressed interest in moving a motion to increase their pay. Francis Jingle with that story. Eddie Kwizera is the MP for Fumbira East County in Kisoro District. He travels over 470 kilometers from his home area to perform his legislative duties in Kampala. I can make even 1,000 kilometers when I'm in Kisoro. I travel on Friday and I'm supposed to be in Parliament on Tuesday, so I come on, on Monday. And you have to do it every month. The ninth Parliament is composed of 384 members and each of them earns a salary of 2.6 million shillings, plus a consolidated allowance that ranges between 20 to 25 million shillings. You can get a mileage of about maybe 10 million or 11 million. All members of parliament get a subsistence allowance of about 8.5 million. That, they also get a constituency mobilization. That's 4 million. You also get town running when you're in Kampala because they are given about 1 million for fuel. Actually, what becomes an income is your salary which is 2.6 with tax. But Kwizera says the complicated situation in the constituency has compelled him and his colleagues to spend the way they do. A member of parliament can facilitate weddings, must attend weddings, must contribute, barrios you must contribute. With them they think that a good member of parliament is the one who attends barrios and contributes or even pays school fees. The Fumbira East MP says the heavy burden he has to shoulder has compelled him and his fellow lawmakers to borrow heavily to meet their voters' demands. You get loans, and when you get the principal and the interest, if totaled up for the whole five years, you find there are more than 1.2 billion, which is your net take home, not income. So says in the parliament, yes, I told the NTV that some MPs are planning to move a motion to increase their salaries. Parliament determines its own or salaries or emoluments for its members is a, a constitutional matter. It's a constitutional mandate. But I want to tell Ugandans that that is not correct. They can give ideas, but still the person to decide what to pay is the president. No, there are no members of parliament who have ever sat and agreed and say let us be paid so much. It only happened in the sixth parliament. Kwizera argues that Ugandans need to be sensitized about the duties that MPs are expected to perform before criticizing them about their demand for a salary increment. Explain to Ugandans that there are things which members of parliament are forced into doing or themselves claim to be doing, whereas it is not their mandate. Jingo Francis, NTV Weekend Edition. The UPDF's Chief of Defense Forces, General Katumba Omala, has paid a visit to Ugandan troops in Somalia to boost their morale ahead of military operations against the Al-Shabaab Islamist militants. General Katumba Omala visited troops in the town of Besli, which is one of the few remaining Al-Shabaab strongholds.
asante sana kwa kazi nzuri ambao mmefanya ambao tumetenda paka sasa hivi namna nadhani tulizungumza single nilisema msiende kuharibu muongeze kwa wenzenyu ambao wamefanya ni walikwama na kwa kweli mmefanya ni mmeongeza so napiga asanti kwenyu kwa kazi nzuri Wanakwenda kukuta single siku watu wameingia ni watu ambao wanauza magari nao wako na akili siku ambao wanajua wameingia wanasonga pale single wanasema eno ya milioni 7 milioni 5 Alafu wana, wako na wanajipaka rangi vizuri sana nje wanaweka music ile ya du 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 wanaona kijana anasema ah kijana na hii nyumbani wanamuuliza kijana gari unapeleka wapi atakufa anasema afande hata kama inakufa lakini nyayo yake itakuwa imeingia wapi utaona <laughs> <laughs> nyayo imeingia hapo hii kamili ukweni wapi <laughs> Police in Mitiana have arrested a 39-year-old woman who confessed to throwing her newborn baby into a pit latrine. The woman identified as Kristin Akankwasa says she carried out the act because she did not know the baby's father. The incident has outraged many residents of Wabigalo village in Mitiana. We have the report. Christina Kankwata is a talk of her village in Mitiana district for allegedly throwing her newborn baby into a pit latrine. <laughs> Her neighbors suspected something had gone amiss after noticing the baby's absence. They notified the police and mounted a search that led them to the pit latrine where they found the baby's body. Now, police say Christine will be arraigned in court on murder charges. We are preparing the we are preparing the papers, we are investigating, and I'm sure we shall produce her in court to answer charges of murder, murdering her own baby. This is the third incident in which women in Mitiana district have dumped their children in latrines in a space of three months. The authorities had not yet established Christine's mental state after she reportedly committed this act. <laughs> It's a very, very unfortunate incident. Moving on, authorities at the World Food Program estimate that about 3 million South Sudanese may face a severe food crisis within a few months due to the heavy rains. The officials say the rains have destroyed lots of crops and rendered many roads in South Sudan impossible. The aid agency has now resorted to airdropping food to the displaced people in the troubled parts of South Sudan. Moses Akena reports. This remote part of South Sudan has had sacks of cereals raining down on its soils for some weeks now. The food drops are meant to feed scores of South Sudanese who are displaced by the civil war that rocked the country last year, as well as those who are affected by flooding. The exercise is being carried out by the World Food Program to overcome the difficulty of getting food to the needy South Sudanese people by road. The area has been experiencing torrential rains since June, which rendered most of the roads impassable. The fragile security situation has also made it difficult for aid agencies to deliver relief items by road. WFP is moving food by air, by land, by water, aiming to reach an estimated 3 million people that are affected by severe hunger in South Sudan. The World Food Program believes the food drops will provide food and nutrition assistance to all the 3 million needy people in South Sudan by the end of the year. The food airdrops began last month in August. It will probably take about two months going by the amount of food in the store, but we don't know for how long it really will go on for. Um, at the moment, we've, uh, so far we've dropped about uh, more than 700 metric tons of food. 
WFP currently has 17 planes it uses to airlift and airdrop food to states like Unity, Jongle and Upper Nile in South Sudan. The planes fly out from bases in Juba, Entebbe and Addis Ababa. This illusion 76 cargo plane leaves Entebbe every day, loaded with 680 bags of maize, sorghum, beans and cowpeas. The agency says it is currently looking for about 35 billion shillings to provide food to 120,000 displaced South Sudanese refugees in Uganda in the next one year. For now, the immediate need of the South Sudanese is for peace to prevail in their young nation. Moses Sakena, NTV. Thank you, Moses. Now moving on, the Police Department of Traffic and Road Safety is using dummies of policemen on motorbikes to help reduce the number of accidents along highways in the country. Our reporter, Agnes Nanduta, recently witnessed the impact the dummies have on motorists in our report. The rush to get news stories recently saw us travel along the Kampala Ginja Highway at quite a terrific speed. We are heading to the eastern district of Mbali when we spotted a traffic police officer along the Mavira forest. Our driver immediately slowed down to avoid getting charged for speeding. But on closer inspection, the traffic police officer turned out to be a dummy, much to our surprise. We stayed longer at this spot to see the impact that this dummy had on other motorists driving through the Mavira black spot. I took on the role of a plainclothes traffic officer for a while and waved down some speeding cars. He has stopped there. Yes, Agnes. Agnes. Right. <laughs> I was driving at a speed, but I didn't know that it was a traffic officer, but I had to stop. Police say these dummies were donated to them by an NGO called Safeway right way. They are meant to reduce accidents on the country's highways by making motorists get the impression that a law enforcement officer is constantly watching them. That effect they put in you after seeing them will uh, be cautionary on, on, on you to reduce accidents or rather speed because speed is the major cause of accidents, one of the major causes of accidents on our roads. But once someone sees that dummy there, there's a way they, they control themselves. And that's the effect we wanted. I observed a reduction of the speed at which motorists were driving while standing here. It has really helped uh, people to behave a bit on the road. But this is not the only strategy that the police are using to control speeding along highways. They have also introduced speed guns at selected black spots around the country. That machine telling us that it's such a such a vehicle is in such a such a speed. These are just some of the strategies that the police are jointly implementing with development partners to reduce erotic energy which has claimed thousands of lives in the country. Agnes Nandutu, NTV, Weekend Edition. Now, in a second part of the Highland of Hope series, Solomon Kawesa looks at the business linkages and changing lifestyles that have emerged in Mubende district as a result of the lucrative gold mining trade. <laughs> This is Christine Biliedi. She is an entrepreneur who hails from Busia district in eastern Uganda. Christine settled in Mubende district a few months ago and has started a new life. She runs a small restaurant located within a gold mine that bustles with activity. She prepares a lot of food to serve her customers who keep flocking her restaurant daily. Christine tells me her main reason to settle here was to make money to support her husband raise their three children. Her startup capital was 50,000 shillings, but she now makes much more daily. Bilieli, along with other restaurant owners, buy the foodstuff from locals in the neighboring villages. 
some of her enterprising colleagues opened up markets and butcheries to cash in on the booming trade here. The prospects of making lots of money in this village has attracted many people from across the country. Benedicto Masagazi is one of them. He left Kampala early this year after his friend convinced him to set up a workshop for repairing the miners' machines and generators. He says his life has greatly changed in just a short period of time. Your family is afraid. I didn't have to go to the I didn't to this mine is known as Kampala. It is the busiest and most popular in the entire area. It has electricity that runs throughout the day, thanks to the initiative of a resident called Charles Boyinza, who procured an industrial generator. A 24-hour service generator. It supplies electricity to fridges, lighting. We even have security lights that is not there in some parts of Kampala. Every day, Boyinza and his colleagues move around the area collecting electricity fees from the people who use it. The charges are based on the kind of appliances one uses. The miners pay up to 50,000 shillings a day. Despite the existence of this amenity, the residents face an acute water shortage. The nearest water source is about 7 kilometers away. Those who fetch it sell a jerrycan for between 1,000 and 3,000 shillings. I visited one of the clinics in the area to find out the kind of ailments the community members are grappling with. I met Romina Chakuhiri, an attendant, who told me that malaria, cough and sexually transmitted diseases are the most common sicknesses registered. She says many HIV patients abandon their ARV medication, which leads to early deaths. They, they are lazy. They, they come here, they tell you, at least give us septrin for the start before we go. I normally give them septrin, but I tell them to go for CD4 count. Accidents and other complications are some of the occupational hazards that are quite common. But Chakuhili blames it on the employers who ignore the safety concerns of their workers. I normally tell them to buy this helmet, especially those who are working in the pukus. Also these ones who are working in the, the other machine that crushes the, the, the soil. They should buy at least this protective to protect, to protect them. So these are the people you give the ailments, they forget to put on the ailments, or other times they put on the ailments, but what they do, just because they are familiar to the jobs, they think that they are part, they are friendly. The lifestyle of the inhabitants of this locale called Kampala is much like that found in the main city. Everyone lives according to their means. The place has been divided into areas that were named after city suburbs like Katanga, Bukoto, Chimesi, and Muyenga, where the rich live. These are not tents, these are our houses. When you look onto the buildings, they have that lifestyle of Kampala. Though this is, uh, this place where we are, it is for the, the bourgeois. Cream de la cream, the area of the high class Muyenga of this place. It is surprising how these people construct their makeshift houses. They even thatch them with grass to reduce on the heat when they are sleeping, especially at night. Besides that, they even have a compound where the kids can even come and play. Indeed, this is the power of gold in Mobende. They have also named the areas different roads for easy identification. During my tour in these mines, I realize that people here are living in fear. In our third part of this series, we will be telling you why and who is causing this fear. Solomon Kawesa, NTV. We will take a short break and return with these stories. Still to come on Talk of the Nation, taking stock of the 2014 National Housing and Population Census. Dewa Kope claims the professional title in the Uganda Golf Open Championship as Willy Chitata lifts the amateur trophy. NTV Weekend Edition continues shortly. You are watching NTV Weekend Edition.
Let your world come alive as you treat your taste buds to the fresh, zesty flavor of new Evervest Bitter Lemon. Bitter is cool. Is no ordinary mechanic. He is a perfectionist. Plus, he's newly married to a woman who is as serious about stains as her husband is about gearboxes. This here is a particularly stubborn axle grease stain just below some gravy that spilled from Richard's lunch just now. Richard knows that as much as he fears no challenge from Land Cruiser carburetors, Mitsubishi engines, or Subaru gearboxes, his wife Ruth fears no stain. As long as I trust New Nomi White, I fear no stain. Fear no stain, because New Nomi White just loves clothes. Stand up to be counted. Brought to you by UBOS. It's your right. Mom, why closing the doors and windows? As if you don't know. Don't you see those people coming? They have been asking every one question in the village. I don't want to give them any information about us. You can't trust people nowadays. We need to answer them. Why? They are collecting information that will help our community in the end. The information collected is used by our leaders to make informed decisions and plan better for all of us. Census is here. Get ready to be counted. Starting from 28th August to 6th September 2014. Together, we count. This message is brought to you by Uganda Bureau of Statistics. There's one mobile network that connects East Africa. Together, we are vibrant, optimistic, and positive. I don't regret it, and I don't care. I don't care. Just say you're ready. We are smart. The mobile network for New Africa. Get a smart SIM card for only 500 shillings, top up 1,000 shillings, and make free smart to smart calls for 30 days. Also enjoy SMS, voice calls, data, and bundles. Smart. Let's talk. You are watching NTV Weekend Edition. Welcome back. Now the 2014 National Housing and Population Census, which was meant to end today, was extended by one day over what the Bureau of Statistics says were disruptions from daily downpours. But will one day make a difference in the exercise that has been dogged with several challenges? Joining me on Talk of the Nation tonight to take stock of the census exercise is Francis Machate, National Census Coordinator. Mr. Mashati, welcome to Talk of the Nation tonight. Thank you. Now, there are several reports that a sizable portion of the population remains uncounted. And there are even claims of enumerators who are seen in neighborhoods but do not go into some homes. I don't know how true this is, despite there being someone at home. Realistically, what percentage of the population has been covered? Well, I must say that as of now, uh, we have co covered a considerable percentage. And uh, as we stand countrywide, uh, our coverage is close to about 95%. Um, of course, other areas like Kampala and Wakiso still register a little low, but uh, by close of the day, we're at about 90%. And we believe that uh, the next day, Sunday, we should be able uh, to clear the remaining of the percentage so that we have the entire population uh, enumerated. What makes Kampala and Wakiso unique? Well, these are densely, densely, very highly densely populated places, as you know, uh, because um, of the nature of activities that take place in these areas. Uh, these are areas that almost everybody comes to to look for employment, uh, to look for business, and uh, uh, to find better way of living. Mm -hmm. So you find that uh, they are heavily populated, um, and of course, even institutions of learning, uh, best medical services everything else is within these areas. So you find that the population really moves towards these areas and uh, it grows by day. So, and why, that is so why not just get more enumerators in these particular areas? This get what more men on the job. This is what we've done. Uh, in fact, 
we have been deploying almost on a daily basis. But as you deploy, you find that the population uh, has grown beyond the boundaries. Uh, it is so big that uh, you cannot actually um, determine at any one time how many numerators you have to deploy. In some cases, you even uh, find that there are areas that were not mapped, but which have come up uh, of late and with large populations. For instance, when we last uh, mapped uh, in 2011, and continue to update up, up 2012, there were areas like Kasokoso that had not come up. There were areas like uh, Chira that have attracted so many people. There are areas uh, like Chiswa which have grown by bounds. And these have really been a challenge because um, our planning was that they would be covered within a given period and with a given number of enumerators. But when we got on the ground, we found that they are too big to be managed uh, using our planned uh, program. And against what you've just said, do you honestly think one extra day will make much of a difference? It will. Why? Because we have deployed to a reasonable level. And we believe that uh, uh, even in places like Wakiso, the real problem was the urban area. And so they are mobilizing people from the outer area uh, to come and join in. And even in Kampala, we're also mobilizing from other areas and our own staff to see that we create a big uh, army of foot soldiers to get in and do the count. And in fact, uh, by close of the day, most of the areas that had uh, claimed not have been enumerated had been enumerated. Well, I, I'll be waiting to see if anyone comes to my doorstep tomorrow to, to get me counted. You, now, you <laughs> do not necessarily have to be there to be enumerated as long as you leave somebody who is responsible at home you will definitely be enumerated. Okay, I'll certainly, I'll certainly give you that feedback. Now, at the start of the exercise, there was an issue with the enumerators on pay. There were some issues around pay and complaining about the pay that they were being given. And now I understand that they will not be paid for the extra day of work. Is this the case? And well, how are they uh, taking that, if it is uh, indeed I the think case? Let me make this clear and to the viewers that uh, the issue of pay is not really with the Uganda Bureau of Statistics. Our role was basically to work with the uh, districts so that uh, through a decentralized system, they are able to recruit, uh, train, and implement uh, enumeration with our guidance. And so we did transfer the resources to the districts, including KCCA. So they are responsible for payment of the enumerators and all people involved in this exercise. If there are any delays, they should be attributed to these centers, the local governments, but not your boss, because we played our part and transferred uh, the resources to them. There was a particular problem with the uh, KCCA, and uh, I must say that is what has caused that problem of people saying we have not paid. But if you did uh, uh, find out from the upcountry districts, there isn't that problem, because they have performed their role as expected. Uh, KCC has its own bureaucracy, uh, which they had to follow, and so it caused that kind of uh, problem. But I must say that they have also overcome it as of now. Okay, turning to the issue of the Moyo district leaders who were arrested while enumerating Ugandans living across the border. Given the history between South Sudan and Northern Uganda, could this have been anticipated and therefore avoided? What couldn't have been upsetted because um, we took it that each country respects the international boundaries as set. But what happened in this case is that uh, uh, people from southern Sudan had sought sanctuary uh, in Moyo and they had actually moved 10 kilometers inside the Ugandan territory. But as Ugandans are, they had given them homage and uh, with time they had multiplied in numbers and therefore sought uh, permission from southern Sudan to establish an enclave of their own and established an administrative system. So when our people went to uh, enumerate, they were subjected to that embarrassment of arrest. But this is an issue that is being taken up at a much higher level because it involves uh, international boundary disputes beyond Yugos. Okay, now, like, a, like I told you at, at the start, I have not been counted, and neither have my neighbors in Chira. It's a good thing you actually mentioned Chira as one of those problematic areas. And we have about 26 apartments in, in one enclosure. 
but that's besides the point. But I know people who have actually said that some of the questions they're being asked are a bit strange. Someone said he was asked whether he actually owns a donkey. I don't know how far true this is, but I can't help but ask, how relevant are all these questions that people are being subjected to? I must say that each of the questions that you're subjected to is very, very important. Uh, it, uh, you know, it's used to collect information on the way people manage their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, if we went to the eastern part of the country, especially Kapchora, you'll find that the, the biggest mode of transport is the donkey. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, you will not believe it. But, you know, these are hilly places where you cannot use so much of a vehicle. The roads are not good. The, the motorcycles are not there. But the donkey moves even when it has rained. It does not skid. <laughs> <laughs> and so this could be adopted even in other parts of the country. Okay, yeah. so the enumerator... But, uh, but I also wanted to add this, that um, mm -hmm. yes, it is true, that, and, you, and indeed you raise a very pertinent issue, that supposing you are not counted by tomorrow, we have put in place mechanisms to ensure that those who are not enumerated by end of tomorrow will definitely be enumerated. We'll How? be issuing a press release which will have a contacts of the respective, especially in the highly... Uh, populated places like Wakiso and Kampala will be issuing a press, uh, press release uh, basically giving contacts where whoever has not been enumerated will be able to contact so that we can make arrangements to have these uh, enumerated. But that will be within a time frame okay. because we also have obligation to release results within a defined period. Okay, and I hope it will not require me going to a particular location. But we rather setting an appointment for when the enumerator can come to my home. <laughs> Our methodology of undertaking the enumeration is very clear. We get you at the household and we take your particulars from there. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us in Talk of the Nation tonight. And we shall be looking forward to having more people enumerated. Because like I said, there are quite a number of people, even on Facebook right now, who are wondering where the enumerators are. But I'm, I'm hoping that your, you have your enlightenment gives them a sense of comfort that they will be counted as well. Thank they you so much for joining us in Talk Thank of the you. Nation. That was National Census Coordinator Francis Machate joining us on Talk of the Nation to take stock of the National Housing and Population Census 2014. We will take another short break and return with NTV Weekend Sport. You are watching NTV Weekend Edition. Use White Star Laundry Bus Soap with a lemon fragrance and you'll have a fresh clean day. Be like a star. Use White Star. Don't stop, My dad is in a star. White Star Laundry Basso. All day fresh clean. Is the number one internet provider, giving you the fastest internet speeds everywhere. The most affordable data bundles on the market. Guaranteed customer care whenever you need it. And countrywide coverage so you can have the best internet experience in Uganda. Simply dial star 133 hash to buy an internet bundle. Internet changes with orange. Today changes with orange. Let's run! Join the run! The Rotary Council Run on Sunday, 31st August at Kololo Ceremonial Grounds, 7 a.m. Register for 10,000 shillings. All proceeds will go to the completion of the Rotary Centenary Bank Cancer Word at St. Francis Hospital, Zambia. Register from the Rotary Office, 9th Floor Nick Building, Centenary Bank Branches, Bridge Credit Finance opposite the main post office and Capital Shoppers Outlets. The Rotary Council Run 2014 is sponsored by Centenary Bank Live on NTV. For every morning to be a good morning, all your baby needs is your love. Good morning, good morning. And a dry night's sleep. New Pampers with more super gel. It locks wetness inside 
keeping it away from your baby skin all night long. Pampers, wishing you love, sleep and play. Eight top clubs. The world's best lineup. Cristiano Ronaldo, Gareth Bell, Karim Benzema. Is Real Madrid on their way to win the championship? Will Toure and Nasri lead their own club to make a breakthrough? Van Persie, Rooney, Manchester United need the chance to prove themselves after changing the coach. 2014 International Champions Cup. New start, new journey, all on Star Times Sport 2. Can't touch. Build them a home that makes them feel safe and loved. When you build a home, build it with multi-purpose cement from HEMA that is reliable and trusted to build durable structures. Because homes are built to last forever. My mama says before touching food, you should wash your hands with soap. But my hands are clean. Can't see germs, but they're everywhere. Look under special blue light. To protect against germs, I recommend regularly use soap. Safeguard removes millions of germs and additionally it inhibits regrowth of germs that might cause skin rashes for hours. That is why me, mommy, daddy and my brother regularly use Safeguard. Supported by the African Medical Association. NTV Sport is brought to you by Smart, the new mobile network for new Africa. Let's talk. Welcome to NTV Weekend Sport. Willi Chitata and Dewa Kope put up great performances in the Uganda Golf Open at the Chitante Gold Course, Golf Course in Kampala. Chitata emerged winner in the amateurs category, while a Kope scooped the biggest portion of the $4,000 cash prize at the professionals event. Willi Chitata's hand for the Uganda Open Golf title today yielded fruit after he leveled the lead with Adolf Muhumza on the last day of the tournament. The final result was obtained after Chitata took the lead on the 12th hole. While the long wait for Dewa Kope to win the professional top prize happened today, a Kope has been struggling to win the title since 2006. A Kope bit of competition from Kenyan Dismas Indiza, Dennis Anguyo and David Odhiambo, who finished second, third and fourth, respectively. A Kope finished with a three under par with Indiza, with an even Anguyo, beg your pardon, who was third, finished with a two of a par. Odhiambo went home with a four of a zero. I just promised myself and I said, really, just keep on doing what you're supposed to do, like keeping your team, your rhythm, of the swing and everything. Don't think about this, uh, you can open of 214. Just keep doing like you're practicing for the next event. I tried so much to make sure that I don't make so many, much, so many errors and it has contributed a lot to my winning this event. And I tried as much as possible to put the ball in play, not even trying to hit it so hard to hit it long, but I was trying to find fairways. And indeed, whenever I found fairways, I was hitting greens. And I must say, probably if there are many, I don't think I missed more than even five fairways in 72 holes. So that alone, I think my accuracy gave me this event. The Cranes have started the group stage of the 2015 Africa Cup of Nations with a march in Kumasi, Ghana. It is 36 years now since Uganda last managed to make the grade for the Africa Cup of Nations finals. In our new series, So Close Yet So Far, we revisit five qualification campaigns that saw the Cranes come organizingly close to breaking its continental football hoodoo. Robert Madoy spoke to ex-Cranes player Tom Luanga and ex Cranes players Tom Luanga and Jackson Mayanja about the 1994 Africa Cup of Nations qualification campaign. In our reports.
That was 36 years ago. Filippo Mondi's goals and guile had propelled Uganda to the Africa Cup of Nations final in Ghana. Having road tripped from Kumasi to Accra just a day before the final, Crane's players were weary. It showed when the elegant defender Tom Luanga ran out of legs as Ghana scored its second and final goal. To date, Luanga hasn't gotten over the Ghanaian's gamesmanship. What we believe in the dressing room, they might have sprayed something because everybody started complaining of the stomach ache, running stomach. And you know, a few minutes to the game, and that drained us and disturbed our preparation and uh, determination to fight. Luanga featured in two AFCON tournaments in the 1970s. The Cranes played at the AFCON finals in 1974, 1976 and 1978. They were quite formidable back in the day. Today, they are perennial bridesmaids. 1978 remains the last time Uganda featured at the AFCON finals. Came 77, we qualified and went to Ghana 78. Now, we were mature players. The team was composed of the old, the experienced, and the young ones, inexperienced. And uh, because of that background, I think we performed well, although we were the underdogs. There have been close shaves where the cranes came marginally close to ending the jinx. 1993 was one such occasion. Uganda needed to beat Nigeria at Nachivuvo Stadium to guarantee qualification. Nigeria, though, are no spring chicken, and striker Rashid Yekini showed just that with this fierce pile driver. The resulting counter-attack saw Sulakato stop in his tracks. What ensued was a sequence of events that is still talked about to date. Kato picked himself up to float a ball into the danger area. The Super Eagles have cleared their lines. Robert Aloro kept the chance alive, stealing in a stinging strike from the edge of the box despite a heavy first touch. The drive was smoothed by the arm of a Nigerian defender before being gathered by Peter Rufai. Penalty was the referee's call. Crane's fans rubbed their hands in anticipatory relish. Uganda was jam-packed with astute penalty takers. Surely any one of them would easily tuck away the penalty. Jackson Mayanja and Majidu Musisi are seen here discussing who should take the penalty. Both of them, though, opted not to have a crack. It was between me and Majid. In fact, when you remember very well, I went and picked the ball myself and took it to Majid Musisi, my senior, because he was the one taking the crane's penalties. He told me, please take this penalty. As I was going behind, Adam Semugabi came up. And Adam Semugabi was playing in the local league. And he was taking those penalties for Sports Club Villa up to the finals of the, club, the CAF Championship. We all know that Adam Semugabi didn't add to his legend. Instead of sticking to his trademark powerful drive, Semugabi went for placement. Sadly for him, the ball went agonizingly wide. It proved to be quite costly as the match ended goalless. A win would have sent Uganda through to the 1994 AFCON finals in Tunisia. Instead, the Super Eagles of Nigeria booked a ticket to Tunisia where they went all the way. So, what lies in the wait for Uganda this time round? We, we, we have a very strong group, Ghana, Togo, Guinea. Most people don't, think, don't know Guinea, but Guinea is a very strong team. I'm more afraid of Guinea than even Ghana because we've always had a chance against Ghana. On his part, Mayanja seems to think that a FIBO top flight league could deal the cranes a fatal blow as club politics did in the early 1990s. The experience I saw was uh, the league being stronger, the more you can even get players to use local best players in the league, in the national team, whereby it's not for today. Arguably, the last formidable top flight league was in 2003. Back then, Uganda came close to qualifying for the 2004 AFCON finals in Tunisia. In the second part of So Close Yet So Far, we shall revisit the underlying factors that dogged the cranes on that occasion. Robert Madoy, NTV Sport.
Uganda cranes have held fancied black stars of Ghana to a one-all draw away in Kumasi, Ghana in the 2015 AFCON qualifier. Tony Maweja gave the cranes the lead before the Ghanaians equalized in the second half, as Alfred Odong reports. Uganda cranes registered a decimal but promising start in their 2015 Africa Cup of Nations after holding the black stars of Ghana at home to a one-all draw. The Cranes took the lead through Tony Maweje after Kizi Toluaga provided a cross for the Iceland-based midfielder to convert the only goal in the first half. In the end is deflected into the back of the net. It's the Cranes that opened the scoring against the run of play. First shot on target, first to find the back of the net. The home side though got an equalizer through a spot kick for the Black Star to secure a one Takes his time, drills it home. Ghana won, Uganda won. Let's Uganda will next face Guinea who are leading the table with three points after beating Togo 2-1. The game will be played at Nambole on Wednesday under floodlights. Alfred Odong, NTV Weekend Sport. In the Black Stars jersey, you see him looking to get that crowd and his teammates worked up and confidently done. Eyes on the keeper the entire time then. So, Onyango gets to his right. We we'll turn to cricket where Uganda has registered a four-wicket win over Tanzania in the ongoing six-side championship in South Africa. Uganda's Roger Mukasa won the Man of the March award after he collected 34 runs. Uganda now awaits the highly anticipated tie against hosts South Africa. New bowler here coming in, first ball. Oh, try to sort of cut it, got a bit of a pick outside edge. They're going for four. So unlucky for the bowler here, but uh, Kenya keep, I mean Uganda, sorry. Well done, Mukasa. To be too complacent in chasing down this total, they'll... Oh, that's what they want to be looking to do. That should go away for four. It does. Yeah, pretty good shot there by Mukasa. Oh, that's just a slog. That's a slog. That will go for four. Yeah, well, in this moment of the game, you take whatever you can get, regardless how it comes. So four runs for him. Getting the inside edge there. Oh, well, he swung hard, but he's hit that in the middle. He's going to walk off the field because he's retired, and he's hit that just shy. Putting his last ball. Will be over. And that, that is that. Six to finish. Deus Mahumza finishes it in style. Uganda, they shake hands. They're happy with their performance. Chase Dana, moderate total of 74 posted by Tanzania. Our man of the match and with Uganda celebrating victory, our man of the match is Roger Mukasa for his innings of 34 that really set Uganda up for that victory. And he receives his man of the match award from Rian Fersfeld from Prestigio. The prize is courtesy of Prestigio. Congratulations, Roger. Take us through your innings. Uh, my coach just told me to go and see the ball and try keep my shape and then try hit the ball hard. Now the Ministry of Health has cleared the Guinea football team to come to Uganda and compete in the Africa qualifiers games. The team had earlier been barred from coming into the country because of the reported cases of the Ebola virus. The ministry has allowed only 25 people to come in who will first have to undergo screening at Entebbe Airport. Uganda Cranes is to play Guinea next Wednesday at Nambole. The delegation has been restricted to only 25 members. Uh, this will include all the players, coaches, and support staff. No fans will be allowed to accompany the players into the country. The team will be screened in Morocco where they are today, uh, the 6th of September 2014, playing against Togo before boarding the plane uh, to Uganda. Three, Gine provided all the details of the players, including names and areas of origin. This was to enable Ministry of Health, working with her partners, the World Health Organization and others, ascertain that none of the players was from the affected areas 
or had been in contact with anyone affected with Ebola in the last 21 days. <laughs>